So today we're looking at Galatians again. We're going to look at the last chapter. But sometimes people will actually read this chapter out of context. In fact, almost all of Galatians is memorized. Certain scriptures are memorized. Certain things are taken out of context. Without understanding the full context and the purpose why Paul wrote this to the churches of Galatia. So what we have to do is kind of think about the context with what he's saying. Yes, there are principles we can glean from that can apply to us today, but the original context actually helps us understand those principles, helps us to constrain and restrict or bring in the boundaries exactly of what we've been reading about in Galatians. Now, we've titled the whole series, Galatians, the Gospel as it should be, because Paul has been endeavoring to try to help us, and the Galatians primarily, back then, when it was written to them, of what the real gospel is compared to what they've latched on to. They've latched on to a gospel of, of religious self-effort, basically. And so we'll go through that again, looking at geographically and in history, where that region was. This is Asia Minor, this whole area here. And this part is Galatia. And this was during the Roman period of the first century, what we call the first century. And this is modern day Turkey, pretty much mid to western Turkey. It's interesting, Ankara, which is the modern capital of Turkey, was also about right up here where this T is. So it was in the region of Galatia. Now again, we've talked about this, that these Gaeltoi, Gaeltic, Gaelic, Celtic peoples, they moved out you know, a little bit, about 100 years after this. And they continued to move up and join the rest of their clans and continued to move into Northwest, uh, Northwest Europe, where the rest of them were, the Gaelic, Celtic kinds, kinds of people, Angles, Jutes, all of them, they're all related. So if you want to catch up with what last week's was, uh, the sermon, you can download it there. Uh, if you want to go over the whole series, go to that URL here. And then if you want to have an overview of the Hebrew Roots movement and how to counter it and what God has in scripture that counters it, you can go through and look at this. It's kind of like a blog with videos in it and everything. And, and these are here to help us understand scripture, get a handle on it. See, today a lot of folks like the, the little bit, the one-liners. The, the little snippets that they want a little bit. They don't want to stay and learn and go deep and understand what the, the word of God is saying, what God is saying to us. They want to just get the snippets and go on with their life. They have their busy life, their, their agendas in life, and they want to just tag Jesus on and move on with their agenda. And what God wants is us to have his agenda move on in obedience with his kingdom purposes in our lives. So sometimes Satan gets us distracted, like with the Hebrew Roots Movement legalism. Back then it was called Judaizer Movement. So that's what we've been looking at. So in review, I'm going to go over scriptures from chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And, and just kind of have, those are snippets, but they give you an overview. So he comes to these Galatians after a great greeting in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 1. And he says this, here it is on the screen, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, he is to be accursed. Anathema is the word. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching or any person is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed, anathema. So that is a blanket curse, really, of anybody at any time from that point forward and from the time of Christ rise for the dead, from the day of Pentecost onward, anybody preaching a different kind of gospel of Christ than what the apostles were preaching they are to be accursed. Think of some organizations today that are religious organizations, even worldwide organizations, even some that have a seat in the UN. 
that purport themselves to be Christian, and yet they are to be accursed because they have twisted the gospel. And that's what he's saying here. So what was the false gospel that Paul was confronting? It was the Hebrew roots movement, legalism, or Judaizers. They would come along behind him, and they would say that you must be a Jew. You must almost convert to be a Jew, and then you can be saved. Well, let's say you got saved. Well, now you need to be a Jew to maintain your salvation. And that's basically what they were saying. You've got to keep all the laws of Moses, all the national Israeli covenant laws that were given by God through Moses to Israel, the Gentile out there, in order to be saved or to keep his salvation, must follow that type of covenant. And so to Paul, that was heresy. To Paul, that was something that the person who's purporting that and proclaiming that should be accursed, should be cursed. And that sounds very harsh, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound very unforgiving? But the problem is the stakes are high because if somebody comes along and tells you something and you believe a different gospel, a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different word of God, so to speak, then you have condemned them to eternal destruction as well. Just as Jesus condemned the Pharisees, that they would travel over hill and dale, over sea, whatever, to make, to make a disciple, a Talmudin of the Pharisees. And he said that you made them twice as much a son of hell as yourself. And so the stakes are high. If you miss the mark with the gospel, then they're these disciples are believing a false gospel. The next generation of disciples will be condemned to hell because they're already that way anyway. You see, it didn't save them. It didn't rescue them. So it's heresy, and Paul was confronting it. In chapter 3, well, you know, before we get to chapter 3, there's a verse that many have memorized in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, in, in human body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Paul, after he confronted Peter, why, Peter, do you compel the, 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 those Galatian Gentiles, or no, not maybe even Galatians, but the Antiochian Gentiles. Why do you compel them to become Jews when you don't even live like a Jew? But you only do that when the Jews come down from Jerusalem. And so Paul was confronting the, the hypocrisy of even Peter and Barnabas, one of his own team, that got caught up in that, in that hypocrisy. And what was he focusing on? The Hebrew Roots movement, the Judaizer movement, and so he was showing by example, even confronting another apostle, that this is very dangerous. And then in chapter 3, he talks to them, now why would you go along with it, you foolish Galatians? Wow. That, that had to hurt them. Who you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit? by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. When you were born again, when you were born of the Spirit, did you receive it by fulfilling all of the law of Moses with your own effort? Did you do that? Could you have? Was there a bell that rang and you know you finally made it? No. Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the faith? See, he hits both parts of the Judaizers. Not only do you need to be saved, oh, I have to be a Jew to be saved, but now in order to maintain and get perfected and grow in Christ, the sanctification work, uh, you have to maintain uh, following the law of Moses. That's what this Judaizer, Hebrew Roots Movement legalism says. And Paul confronts both. Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit or by the Spirit, being born again? Are you now being perfected, that is growing in Christ, becoming more like Christ by the flesh, that is human self-effort. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law, that is you fulfilling the works of the law, or by hearing with faith, that is trusting in Christ, trusting in Christ and following him? Which is it? 
And he goes on, he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by or follow by or do all of the things written in the book of the law to perform them. James goes on and says in the book of James that if you fail in one part of the law, if you're trying to pursue the law, you, you fail in one little part, you've broke all the law. And so that's what he's saying here. Now to know that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. So if you want to have righteousness with God, you must live by faith like Abraham. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them must live by them. So if you're going to try to do it, then you have to do it all perfectly. And there's no way you can, but Christ did for us on our behalf. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Being born of the Spirit, born again, we were born again. It wasn't because we fulfilled everything, it's because we trust in the one who did fulfill everything. We trust in Him who did it on our behalf. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The law showed us we were sinners and pushed us to the foot of the blood-stained cross where we were humbled by the, by the law. That was the tutor. That was the tutelage. That was the schoolmaster to bring us to the foot of the cross that we cannot do it on our own. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. And over and over again, he says, now that you're in Christ, you're not under the law. Not under the law. I'm not under it. So why are you trying to do this? That's what he's saying. So therefore, he goes into chapter 4, talks about slavery and freedom from slavery. And talking about Hagar and Ishmael, Sarah and Isaac. Which one is the child of promise? Which one is the child of bondage? So he talks about that. And he says, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of this world or the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Oh, yes. So even if you're a woman, you're a son. Just, just get that. You know, that's the whole thing, you know, we're the bride of Christ. So, you know, if we're the bride of Christ, you guys are sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, or the spirit of adoption, as Roman 8 would say, in the parallel, the spirit of his son into our hearts, saying, or crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. So these pictures really help us see being redeemed from the, the slave block down at the auction and, and having yourself being set free from those chains but then not only that you are now a son now a child an heir you've went from a slave one who was condemned one who was in slavery and bondage now and then he continues to ask them why would you go back to the slave block after you become an heir and that's what chapter four was about why would you go do that and you are doing that when you go through and bound yourself to this Hebrew Roots Movement legalism, to this Judaizer stuff that you have to do these things in order to either maintain your salvation or have some sort of better relationship or a first-class relationship with God compared to those other Christians who have a second-class relationship. See, they're deceived thinking that they're in these chains and they're just bracelets and jewelry, you know, and let's pretty them up, but you're still in slavery. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity of the flesh or for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So the freedom that Christ calls us to is not a freedom for us. We are set free to serve others. You see, the old sinful flesh 
makes us only think of ourselves and how it relates to us. From the freedom we are in Christ, it is, how can I be used of God to help others? I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust or desires of the flesh or the old sinful nature. For the old sinful nature of the, the, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, that is, in, they're, in, they're in, like enemies of each other, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So not only being walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, you're set free from sin and the law. Both. We are set free from that which is sin's penalty and being set free from the power of sin in our lives in the walk of sanctification as we are getting more and more like Jesus, cooperating with him. Because notice the if. The ifs in there. These are conditional Growth That is, we can grow as much as we want in him as we cooperate with him. And of course, it's as he leads us. Isn't that great? That's, that's awesome. And now Paul enumerated in chapter 5. The reason why we're going over this is to show you the context of what then Paul brings up in chapter 6. You have to kind of see the flow of this. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Just open up a newspaper. Think of it. We see it on display, especially with social media. All the stuff that we see that we say, oh, that, that's horrible. Those people. <laughs> Those people are us in our old sinful nature. That is, we could be just as bad if we didn't have the Holy Spirit in us. But let's listen to what it says here. Let's, these, this is the result. That is the fruit of the sinful nature. Just like the fruit of the Holy Spirit. See? It's a contrast here. Look at, the, look at these. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy. That was on display a lot this week. Let me tell you. At Capitol Hill. Um, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties. Yeah, wild parties. Huh? And other sins like these. You know, we looked at other lists, and there's one that translates it in this translation. It says, wasting time. Those who practice it, wasting time. Wasting other people's time, and wasting your time, wasting God's time, wasting time. Really. Like, you're breathing, and you're wasting time. Well, that is included in other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have said before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, we talked about how those who have parades of boastful pride days, they, they you know, pick any of these sins. Now, you don't have you know, those who rob banks having big pride parades, but you do have the very first thing, sexual immorality is on display on TV everywhere and is being pushed as if it's okay. Well, God says no. And so someone who comes along and says they're a Christian, but they like all this and they don't have any qualms about it, don't feel any regret about it, they're okay with it, they're not struggling with it. You know, nothing come along unless maybe it might affect their marriage or their business or whatever and they might get canned if they don't get this under control. Uh, but they're really not being under the conviction of the Holy Spirit here about these things. It says those folks who practice such things live this. That's what they're talking about. Not talking about a Christian who occasionally sins and has issues because of their lifestyle, their tendency of weakness. That's a different thing we're talking about. This, he's talking about this is the fruit of what sin looks like in raw, full power of what it has without any control by God. Okay. And then he contrasts this. Now, this is for our spiritual temperature. Check your temperature, your spiritual temperature. Are these kinds of things cropping up? It might be showing that the fruit of the Spirit isn't as strong in your life. And this is more strong because you're not having a deep relationship with God. You're not paying attention. You're not deeply devoting yourself to Him, not fully surrendering daily to Him and, and allowing His Spirit to fill you. Uh, you're going to have this. The old sinful flesh is still in us. And so the Holy Spirit must be allowed to be stronger so that he bears fruit. 
And so he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And he's talking about the deepness of how the Holy Spirit can transform a life. Christ transforming a life from the inside out is more powerful than any, any kind of human effort that you could do. Any kind of anything. You could try to do these things, but they're temporary and external. But allowing Christ himself to change you by the Holy Spirit will result in this. Now, it might be a little bit of love and joy and peace, but at least you're bearing some fruit. At least Christ is leaking out in you. Remember I said, allow Christ to be himself to you, in you, and through you, and you will see this. But the only way that happens is you have to follow him. You have to be in relationship with him. An uh, old sinner who is out in his old sinful flesh and doesn't have Christ, doesn't have the Holy Spirit, is not born again, there is nothing you can do to help them to become like this. It says uh, there's nothing in the world that could do it. Against such thing, there is no law. So human laws, uh, any, any kind of 12-step uh, program, 10-step program, whatever, temporarily might help that person a little bit. But unless Christ changes a person from the inside out, you will never see this sustained kind of growth in a person being changed from glory to glory into the same image of Jesus Christ, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says. So he says, now I want you to see this, how it flows to Galatians chapter 6. Chapter 5, think about it. This was a letter without chapters and verses. It might have been paragraphs. I don't know if they had that back then, but there might have been something like that. So it flows from that list of sins, which is above that, the fruit of the Spirit, and then goes right into this. This is one thought built upon another. And so let's read this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. So no human self-effort could do this. There's no way you could try by trying to fulfill the law of Moses to do all these things that would change your very character deeply within you, to change you so that what flows out of you is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And it may include turning over some tables. See, that was righteous anger. There is such thing as that. But it was still under the control of God's spirit, right? based upon the Word of God. So now those who belong to Christ, you see, that's what he's talking about here. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's a choice. That's when Jesus says, you know, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me daily. Deny yourself daily. Not glorify yourself. He's talking about the old sinful flesh. The old sinful fleshly nature that we inherited from Adam and Eve. Deny yourself. It doesn't mean to hate yourself. That is you personally, the real who you are. But it means that old sinful nature, the desires it has, the wants it has, its agenda. It has an agenda and it's always whispering. Hey, you could probably do it this way. Shortcut here. I mean, we know the voice because we're very familiar with it. I mean, very familiar with it. And our old sinful flesh and Satan like each other, and they kind of like best buds. And so there's a connection there. That's how he gets to us, to trip us up. So he says this, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The old sinful flesh has passions and desires. It has a passion and desire of leading you into selfishness, self-centeredness, narcissism, and all the other kinds of isms and self hyphenated blank stuff and that is always rebellion to God and it may be cloaked up and clothed in religiosity it may look really religious but it's still the flesh but those who are in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires that means I have reckoned my old sinful nature as crucified and couple places Paul even says this I am crucified to the world and the flesh and it is crucified unto me so we need to do that daily we have to allow that to happen 
And then he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So let's say at this point, somebody's reading all of this and they think they're set free. Wow, I know that I've been under the bondage of this Hebrew Roots Movement legalism. Wow, I am set free. They still have chains. They have not been set free. They haven't fully repented. They haven't been set free yet, but they want to go tell others. Well, if the old sinful flesh is in control, which it would be, they're going to talk to other people. Hey, you dummy, what's going on with you? You're stuck in this old thing. I just found out that I don't need to be under this Hebrew Roots Movement stuff. And that's where the envying and, and all this challenging comes in. And you have these quarrels. Because the person who's trying has almost got set free. They're, they're like, oh, wow, I don't need these chains anymore. They're not bracelets and beautiful jewelry, you know, that I've been bound to. I better ha help others to get set free. But they themselves haven't been set free yet, you see. So once they are set free, then they will go help others. And that's what Paul's going to talk about in chapter 6, these first five verses. That's how it flows. Don't allow this to happen. Don't still stay in the old sinful flesh when you're doing this. Rely upon Jesus. Allow him to lead, guide, and direct you to rescue and to recover others. Don't do it the world's way, the flesh way, uh, what all society says the way to do that, to help people. But he says, follow Jesus. So, Go to chapter 6. Do you see how it flows? It goes from walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and then, oops, maybe I'm not. So I might try to do this in my own self-effort to help others. Nope, don't do that. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted bearing one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. That's the title of this message today. Fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. So let's unpack this. Now that we see the context of how it flows, let's unpack this. So after we've been rescued in Christ from sin and false doctrine, or from anything that Christ has rescued us from, uh, we need to be ready to be humbly used by God to rescue others, that Christ would use us to rescue others. So the very first thing is, uh, notice the word humbly in there. Okay? So, brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass... Now, think of the context of what trespass he's talking about. The trespass, or the sin that the Galatian churches have been caught in, was that false doctrine of Hebrew Roots movement. So, if someone... Let's say you've been set free from this, and you really realize it, and you truly have been set free. You have repented of that, and you have surrendered again to Christ... And Lord, use me now to help my, my fellow brethren in my church family who have been caught up in this. Use me, Lord, to help others to get out of this, this bondage of religiosity, of religious self-effort, of Hebrew roots movement, Judaizers. He says, if anyone is caught in any trespass. Now, again, that is a principle here. We're going to talk about what it context and then principle. Context and principle. So what was going on? So that's what was going on. Some folks are being set free in those churches. And now he is calling upon them, a high calling. If you've been set free, if you're spiritual, that is, if you're following the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, right? Then you're going to follow Christ. You're not under the law. So you're going to be able to be used by God to rescue others. It says, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Not harshness, gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So when you've been rescued, then it's, it's your duty to go help others. Now, you need to be led forth by the Spirit. And I'm going to talk about that, how the, 
the Spirit will lead you based upon who you are in Christ in the context of your local church family. It's not you as a lone ranger. It never is. We are like cells in the body, so to speak. So also we must be proactive and get trained. That is, you, need, you might need to be trained in God's word how to do this. Follow those principles. And that's what he's doing here. He's helping us understand how do you restore someone who's caught in false doctrine, who's caught in some sort of sinful lifestyle of those things that he enumerated in chapter 5. Folks that are truly born again, but they're caught into these things because they've had this baggage they brought into Christ of habits they're used to and they're strongholds, sinful strongholds, but they can be uprooted. They can be destroyed. Uh, we can help them, but it's based upon God's word alone in the Holy Spirit's power alone in Christ's name alone. Um, okay? Only Christ can rescue. And that's what he's saying here. Only Christ can do the rescuing, but he will use us. So think about this. All of those folks who are caught in that, he is telling them to be careful. Because you may have developed, you might have liked some of the things you were doing. Now, if you're in a sinful kind of thing, sinful practice, immorality, there might be some things like, wow, I kind of remember that, and I wish I, you know. Or if you're in the Judaizers movement, wow, I really liked, you know, doing all these rituals and things. And, you know, and that's what he's saying here. Be careful that you don't get tempted to go back into that. While you're trying to rescue folks, see, that's why you have to rely upon Christ. We cannot think, well, I've got this list now. Thanks, Jesus. I'll go and do it. Without him being involved and leading you and giving the strength as well as the shielding protection that we need when we do that to help others. I mean, this is a loving duty. We need to do that. In love, serve others, right? We are called to do this. So be careful. I mean, this is just one of the sins he's talking about, Judaizers. The principle here is everything. So you see somebody else, you see Andy blowing it. And you can see those things leaking out in me, that the old sinful flesh and I, a little bit of pride or whatever it is, you know, talk to me. Pray for me first. And then talk to me gently, alone, personally, and uh, let me know. Hey, but we all need to be like that. We all need to be open to that. It, and that's what the whole one another's is all about in the local church family. So be careful with landmines. There could be landmines, and there, people can be landmines in some cases. So be careful. As you do this awesome work, So I want to talk about this just a little bit. Some of this here is a repeat, but the last sentence isn't. Many of us have weaknesses and tendencies toward various types of sins and, do, and, and not to others. Many of us have those weaknesses and tendencies. We're human. We're descendants of Adam and Eve. We have those kinds of things. So as we go into those battle lines with trying to rescue others, there may be something that's like, Maybe you shouldn't be in that zone to help that person because you have some tendencies in that zone and maybe you're not strong enough yet to see. And that's what Paul's warning. Be careful when you're doing this because, again, I always say this, sin is the most powerful force in the universe short of God. Sin is so deceptive you don't even know it's happening until your eyes are opened by God. So understand, those who are caught in sin may not even know they're there until they're confronted with it. And that's why you pray first, that God would open their eyes first and allow you to be used of Him in a gentle way to help them into the light. Because once God's law or God's ways are shown and exposed to them, they compare what they're doing to what God really wants them to be and do. That's when it happens. It's like, oh, wow. I guess I'm blowing it. I can't believe I'm doing that. Do you see how that works? And so that's what he's saying here. But let's say you have a weakness and you might, you know, stumble in that area because you're not fully strengthened in that. You, God hasn't pulled out the strongholds yet. And 
you know, we're still called to do these things even though we're not perfect. So be careful. There are landmines. There are landmines out there. You should know kind of the tendencies. And if you don't know, your, your, your significant other spouse, whatever, will know, or others around you may know what your significant um, tendencies are. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you don't see them, but others do. You know? And, and that's what, what is being taught here. And I like with this, there's this wise man that used to be on TV. And he really just says this, stay humble, my friends. And, and let's read the rest of these other verses. Bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You can't have pride when you're doing this. You can't think you're better than other people. All you are is a person who found bread. You were a beggar that found bread, and you, you're going to help another beggar to help them consume the bread of life. You see, we, we've got to put ourselves in, I'm just a brother or a sister to the one that I'm rescuing or attempting to rescue. And I may be doing that with another person or more. It may be a team effort kind of thing. Does that make sense? So bearing with one another's burdens, therefore fulfill the law of Christ humbly. That's where it, that's where it is, humbly. Uh, God allows us to be his agents of his grace to each other. That's amazing. You know, he could do it much better than us. Jesus could have just stayed here. I mean, it would mess up the whole plan, but Jesus would be better at it than we would. But to a person who is surrendered and led forth by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, overflowing with the fruit of the Spirit, that person to the degree of that, is able to help others. And that's a cooperative degree. That is, I cooperate with Christ in how much I really want him to use me and, and to flow through me. So Paul is using concept and principle based upon this law or principle within the new covenant. When he says the law of Christ, didn't say the law of Moses, notice? The law of Christ. And he says that in, in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, not without the law, but with the law of Christ. And he's talking about the new covenant law, that is the following of Jesus in a personal way, according to the word of God, not according to whatever you think, but according to the word of God being led forth by the spirit. And so we are, and how do we do that? I mean, it's the fulfillment of God working through us, Christ working through us in love, serving one another. And so restoring others, that's just one aspect of our serving of one another. But the reason why Paul is imploring them to do this is those who are coming aware that they're caught up in this false doctrine of Judaizer movement, Hebrew roots movement, messianic craziness movement, legalism. I'm not talking about going to your roots, understanding the Hebrew roots and all that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about legalism, where you impress on others, you have to follow and obey the Sabbath laws. You have to. All the seven feasts that are in Leviticus 23, you have to obey them and do them and celebrate them if you're going to follow Christ. That's different than, hey, if you want to, that's great. And you can do those things in light of Christ. Yeah, that's great for you. You can learn more about who Jesus is. Great. Go do it. But once you impress upon another person in Christ saying, well, you're not really a full fulfilled Christian or following Yeshua or whatever, unless you do these things, that's the legalism that Paul is talking about and confronting here, including circumcision back then. That was the big deal back then. Today, it's like, well, are you worshiping on Sunday or, or on Saturday or whatever? I mean, it's just weird. But every, every age has its own thing repackaged. So he says, but also think about this. When you're rescuing people, be careful pride doesn't get in there. Once pride sneaks in and you think you're somebody, you really aren't. Now in today's age, oh, to say when he is really nothing, to just say, well, you're just a nothing. Understand the context of what he's saying here. He is not saying you're nothing, but he's saying compared to Christ, compared to who you think you are, that prideful image that you have of yourself, you're not really that. You know, 
That's when you call out, who do you really, th who do you think you are? Have you ever heard somebody say that to you, maybe? Or you said that to somebody? Who do you think you are? Well, that's what he's saying here. Be careful because you're going to end back up in the deception zone. Look how easy it is. Notice how many times he warned. Look at the warnings he has over and over again in here. See, that shows that a Christian who follows Christ can slip into these things. So we have to be aware. We have to allow this in. Now, information, this is information. Unless that information is empowered by the Holy Spirit and implanted in our life and become part of us, it's just information. Well, that's great, but your character isn't changed. Your behavior hasn't been changed. The who you are hasn't been changed. You have to surrender to Christ, and you have to surrender to what he's saying here. You have to allow Christ himself. See, that's the key in all of this. It's not me saying, wow, thanks, Lord, for the information. I'll go do it. And that is our tendency, especially in the Western world. I'm going to pull up my bootstraps, and I'm going to do it. Well, look, you can't do it. I mean, there's some things I know I can pull up my bootstraps. I can tie my shoes. I can pick out my clothes, maybe. I might need a fashion <laughs> helper, somebody to help me. But that isn't something I'm relying upon Christ to do. You see, these are the things I have to rely upon Christ to do because now I'm touching on the holy. I'm touching upon people's lives. And it relates to restoring them to the truth. It relates to restoring them to a relationship with God where they're following Christ according to the word of God alone, not according to the word of God plus other philosophies. You see, it's following Jesus. Now, when I lift up the hood of my car, I'm not going to look to the Bible to find out how to replace a spark plug. But if I'm working with another person to do that, I may need to follow what the Word of God says in my relationship with that person and how we work together. And it's like, oh, I should do it this way with that person. And that's where the character development and changes that Christ does in your life. So when he says bear one another's burdens, he is not saying that you are to do it for them. Okay? Doesn't mean that you are to do the things that they can do. It never means that. It means that when they are in that weakened state, you might have to help them, but you have to help them there also bearing the burden. You know, you're helping them get to the place of freedom, but you're not doing it for them. You can't do it for them. They have to be rescued by Christ as you encourage them to reach out to him and trust in him again and to really believe that Christ can change them. They may have come to a place in their life that maybe they're far too gone and there's no way Christ can change them. Well, God's going to do it if they trust in him, you see, but it may not be overnight. It may have taken them a while to get to where they're at. I mean, God can snap the finger and change you, but it might hurt a lot. Let me explain. Strongholds, deep roots of sinful behaviors, that now that you're in Christ, the power has been cut off for that. But those roots and the structure is still there. The patterns, the familiar behaviors, that which you're very familiar with, it's already there. So let me tell you a story about some, uh, what we call devil grass or this wild Bermuda grass. We had this one side of this hill, we were putting cactus out, but we wanted to make it look really nice. We also wanted to put the cactus there because the kids were driving their, their, uh, their bikes off and jumping you know, into the street, really. And there's a street that comes in and they could kill themselves, but they're also breaking our sprinklers, etc. So we put these really sharp cactus out there. But this devil grass, this wild Bermuda grass started growing there. And we, no matter what we did, we had all this weed killer, grass killer, but we didn't want to hurt our cactus. And, and so, I mean, literally there was this patch and I put gasoline on that. I lit it on fire and it only touched the surface. It started growing back. So someone told me what you have to do is pull up the roots. There's no other way to kill it. Or there's some kinds of killers that will kill the top and it goes down into the roots and it, it dies, but it can, you know, hurt the soil too. So nothing else will grow. It might leach into you and, and then kill your cactus. So it's like, how do I do this? So I had to 
get the shovel out there and dig it up. Six feet deep were some of those roots. And you see, that's how sin is. It's so deeply entrenched. It's going to take some work of the Holy Spirit himself to uproot. And it can be painful, you know, confronting those issues and that, that kind of thing and pulling those up. But you see, as Christ is pulling out the roots, he's replacing with his character. He's replacing. So the old sinful nature of all those characteristics of the sinful fruitfulness, which is horrible, he's replacing with the fruit of the Spirit. And that's what he's talking about here. You cannot do this. You can't, you can't go and dig up that. But you can help them get to the one who can. To really rely upon and trust in and rely upon the one who can actually change you. He is the only one that can do that work. And it may take a while. And it may be a while that you're thinking, well, God, are you even there doing something? And yes, he is. He's just working at getting to the root so he doesn't kill you in the process. The painfulness of some sinful roots and strongholds are horrible. But he has to pull them out. When he pulls them out, he replaces them with Christ. But it may be painful. It may be some reaction. It may be something going on in your life during that time. He may use crisis in your life to break up the fallow soil, so to speak, and to get that in and get the seeds of Christ's character in there to grow in replacing. And sometimes it's just a displacement that kills those roots. On and on. Think of all the analogies that we know in agriculture uh, that relates to that. So we have to lead them to freedom, who is Christ, but in the process we can never think of ourselves as holier than thou. We can't come and, and, and do this and, and help them and then somehow think, well, you know, they're really, they're so stupid and dumb. And, I, you know, I'm talking to myself here. I am not perfect in this at all. But we all look to the word of God, and that is what our standard is. And it's a pretty high standard. In fact, it's a miraculous standard. In fact, on your own, you can't do this. Only by surrendering to Christ daily and surrendering in that moment when you are confronted. You may confront some stuff as you're helping people. All of a sudden, oh, I have that problem. Or I have a little bit of that or from remnants of that. And I need to surrender. You see? Because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus is the rescuer. Jesus is the one who is the rescuer. Always remember that. Jesus is the rescuer. Kind of like that, that uh, video from uh, Rend, what was it called, Rend something? The Irish group. Anyway, they have the rescuer. So let's go on here. Bearing one another's burdens, always remember this verse. And there's, it's repeated in two books, James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So we must approach doing work for God and restoring others and helping others with humility. And I'm talking to myself as much as anyone else. We need this. We need his grace in the process. So verse 3 through 5. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We must humbly evaluate ourselves and be responsible. Verse 4, but each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another, for each one will bear his own load. Now, he's not talking about boasting in the sense of boasting in front of others, hey, I'm better than you, because he, he, he kind of tamps that down with saying in regard to yourself not in regard to others. So what he's, he's really saying, hey, I'm pretty excited. I really grew in this area. I just want to let you know, wow, I came through a breakthrough. That kind of attitude of that. Not, I came through a breakthrough and you're still stuck. <laughs> I mean, but that could be the attitude, right? He's saying, don't do that. So let's talk about the examination, evaluation. First and foremost, we are to... As we are seeking to be used of God, we are really only responsible for ourselves, not saving the whole world when any type of rescue is needed. You are not God. God is. 
Okay? You can't rescue everybody. You must examine yourself personally before God and make sure you are fit for the master's use. So in personal evaluation, you want to be usable in a place of humility and a place of deep surrender unto him where you can be used of him to do this. And you have certain giftings from God. Now here's the deal. You should know the giftings you have and that you can ask others to help you with that. Okay? But stay in that gifting zone. Don't try to do something that's outside your gifting zone. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit gifting you. You know, that within the church, how we are to use our gifts to help one another grow in Christ. So if, you, you know, you're not called to be a pastor, teacher, or whatever, but you think that you could do it, I mean, that's, stay out of that zone. If you're called with mercy and, and, and helps and all those, the various gifts that are there, stay within that zone that the Holy Spirit can flow through you that you can best help. But that also means that you may need help from others, that the combination of what you both do as a team would be best for that person, you see, or persons you're a part of a team, you're a part of a group, and how those gifts work together, uh, that's what he's talking about here. So be careful in your own regard, that is regard to yourself, what you are doing. And, and then as you're doing this, stay close to Jesus. You see, you might see a need to rescue and there is no way you can do it, but you can pray. You can pray that God, how can you use me to help this person? It may be God says, no, I've got somebody else in, that I've already dispatched for that person. You know, be sensitive to God's spirit in that. There's sometimes you cannot rescue everybody. I mean, you might want to. And that's good to have that in you, to want to help people. But you can get burned out. And self-effort then will start showing up. And then you're burned out with helping. So stay close to Jesus because Satan's right there to get you out and to make you do your own thing. Stay close to Jesus and do his thing. <laughs> so, secondly, we evaluate ourselves not based upon other people. I mean, I can think as a preaching preacher or teacher, I look at some people like Charles Spurgeon, John MacArthur Jr., uh, various guys, and I think, man, I am not like them. I wish I was like half like them. You know, that kind of thinking, he says, don't do that. Don't think that way. And then the other way is, don't think you're better than others. So it's not just thinking you're better than others, it's I'm not good enough also is in there. You need to evaluate yourself in light of Christ. Am I uh, becoming more like Jesus? Are those fruit of the Spirit coming out of me? Or is it the fruit of sin more coming out of me? Selfishness, self-centeredness. And he's saying, Use Christ as your temperature gauge, so to speak, your template, the example. We need to look to him. I mean, I could look to Apostle Paul. I'd like to be like the Apostle Paul, uh, but I keep ending up like more like Peter and foot in the mouth, you know, or, or I end up like Barnabas sometimes, you know. I, but I just need to shoot for Jesus. I need to be more like Jesus. In how I serve him, I need to look to Jesus. I need to allow the Holy Spirit to guide me. What's my spiritual temperature? And then prayerfully seek God to change us. You know, prayerful, oh, well, there, I, I see there's a lot of shortcomings. Now, pray, pray about it. Even ask somebody else to pray, join in with you. And says, oh man, I'm so glad you finally asked me to pray with you about it because I've, you've been kind of blowing it in this one area. Don't do that. You know, be nice, be gracious. <laughs> uh, be gracious with one another in this. So evaluating ourselves and then being responsible. Finally, as we seek to be used by God to rescue and restore others, we, we should never shirk our own responsibilities as born again disciples of Jesus. So sometimes we can get fooled into thinking that it's somebody else's responsibility when God is really calling you to be a part of something, to do something to help others. Uh, one of the big things, every single, every, every person within the body of Christ has been called to share the gospel. Uh, now evangelists do it better. 
I'm, I'm, and they do it more effectively and they can train others to do it uh, in some cases I'm just saying not always but in many cases the evangelists can lead people to Christ left and right and you, and, and you go out and try to do the same exact same thing and and it, and you're prayerful and, and you're humble and you pass out the tracks and you talk to people and nobody comes to Christ you know but at least you are you are doing what you're supposed to do and so that is something all of us are called to do to be a witness another one is love one another but how the flavor of love how that how that is shaped and how you help others and love others is always going to be flavored by a couple things God's spiritual gift in you and who you are in Christ the your personality your tendencies you know your quirkiness whatever that, that's going to flow through you, even if two people in the body of Christ in that local church fellowship had the same gifting that is the Holy Spirit gifting, it's going to flow out of them a little different. It's unique to who you are. And so you need to be responsible in doing that, uh, not allowing others to do things for you. Think, well, the pastor's supposed to do it, or, or this other person who's, you know, he's had a lot more experience and everything, and I'll just pray, you know, or whatever. We're called to do beyond praying and beyond just evangelizing. All of us are to evangelize in some way. All of us are to pray. All of us are to love one another. But all that loving one another is so that we can be fit to evangelize more and to bring more people to Christ. It isn't just to have a holy huddle. You know, this and the life group is for the Christian. It is not for the lost. But you are for the lost. I am for the lost as agents of the gospel when we are built up and equipped so that we can go out and do that as a church, as a church family, and doing that which Christ has called us in his strength. Now, I always will say this. It's in the context of your local church family. It's in the context. It's never just in uh, how uh, some people think of the Lone Ranger. You know, well, at least Lone Ranger had Tonto, right? Hi ho, silver, and it, that that dates me already. Um, but but those kinds of responsibilities we have is almost always in the context of the local church family. So when you feel this is calling of you and you're going to go do it, uh, don't divorce it from the local church family. You're a part of the local church family. Use those gifts, talents, and abilities that God's given you within the local church. And it should line up with your, the giftedness God's given you, the Holy Spirit giftedness that he's given you, so that the church can evangelize, plant churches, reach the unreached people groups in missions, etc. It has to be something that relates to the relational context of your local church family. And you see this. As we went through the book of Acts, you saw that. When we went through First Thessalonians, uh, church as it should be, you know, uh, we went through all of those to see, contextually, you see how the local church family, the, the body, is, is local. It isn't just the worldwide body, but what local church family you've covenanted with, that you are a part of, your gifts, talents, and abilities are, used, are, are to be used to help others grow in Christ. What you have to contribute. There's no way I can do what other people can do. And you may have that which nobody else can do but it's within the body of christ we need each other you see we have the ability to do this he says so but make sure you bear your own load it is your own responsibility don't forget god has called you to do it god has called you to do it and and it kind of comes back to this in Galatians 5.13, he sums it up here. He says, For you have been called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. That's really what he's saying. Through love serve one another. And as you do it, uh, God will bless and cause the growth of the body as he wants. So let's, uh, let's sing this last song. It, uh, I know some people here really like it.